Hello, this is Dr. Moyer, and I am going to discuss Gazelle's theory on develop child development, um, otherwise known as Gazelle's maturation theory. And it's important to know that this theory is the foundation of almost every other theory of child development. Um, so early in the 20th, 20th century, this was a pretty big deal. And what Gazelle emphasized was sequential development. So he believed that children developed individually at their own pace, but that every child followed the same sequence. And this is still um, believed today and used today to understand child development. He said that there were two major forces that influence development, environment and genetics. So genetics affect when um, in the rate of development, but the environment taught children how to behave in a proper manner. So while he believed the environment was important, he would definitely not say that children develop in a bubble. He did say, and he did believe, that children all have the same sequence and regardless of um, trying to teach children to do things in advance or ahead of schedule, it doesn't, it never has really worked to the point where you could argue that Gazelle was wrong. Um, he always said that children will master tasks when their own inner urges push them to do so, or genetics, um, and that if you do try to teach children thing, things in advance, you really, they might learn a little bit and you might gain some ground, but not very much. Um, so he emphasized sequential de development and he also emphasized the importance of letting children tell you when they're ready to learn things. Um, he did participate in this twin study it's pretty important, helped him to understand development better. Um, and so what he learned was that when you compared these two babies on development and you tried to influence one of the twins and tried to speed up development, that the effects were very small. Um, and so he believed that this pointed to, again, children telling you or letting us know when they can develop. Um, and he did believe that development was affected by personality and temperament, but that still there was always going to be this sequence and that you can't, you can't rush the sequence or even skip different points of development. Um, he was the first to develop patterns. He said that we should measure growth in patterns because you can't just measure in inches and pounds. You have to measure by what the, they, what the baby can do. And a good example of this was vision. So at birth, baby's eyes roam around aimlessly, um, but after a few days or hours, depending on their rate of development, they can stop and look at objects for brief periods of time. And they can even learn to stop and stare at will. This is possible because a new patterned connection has been made between the nerve impulses in the brain and the tiny muscles that move the eyes. That's what Gazelle would say. So, and then patterning continues to widen when babies learn to organize their eye movements according to their hand movements. So he would propose that a, a patterned connection had been made between nerve impulses in the brain and the muscles that move the eyes. Um, and so, again, genes direct development, but development is stimulated into action by outside signals. Um, and so, this is also evidenced in baby's grasp. At six months, most babies are able to pick up objects with a, a crude grasp, but by 10 months, they most can p use a pincher grasp um, where you kind of pinch with your thumb and your index finger. And 
So he was important for pointing out these different points of development for babies. Um, but he was also known for some other things as well. He talked about reciprocal interweaving. Um, he m proposed that the two hemispheres of the brain develop individually, but need to eventually reach effective organization. And so they don't develop at the same time, but eventually they both need to work together, and that's when development is complete. And he would point out that this, this occurs, and you can see evidence of this, with hand movements, um, with walking, um, with using different grasping techniques, and that eventually one side of the brain becomes more dominant and determines things like what, whether somebody is right-handed or left-handed. And that we have to balance the dualities of our nature, but people don't achieve perfect balance. So we have what's called functional asymmetry. And this is important. And so again, it's about the two hemispheres of the brain working together and you will see development occur or evidence of development occurring in one versus the other but they have to eventually work together. An example of this is the tonic neck reflex. So when babies lay on their back, um, gazelle observe that they like to, if you turn their head one way, they will extend their arm out the arm that is on the side where the baby's facing and then they'll put the other they'll flex their other arm behind their head almost like they're in a fencing posture and it's a reflex that all babies develop um, it's dominant during the first three months after birth um, it's not entirely clear what the purpose is at this point but he would say if you flipped the baby's head to the other side you would see the arm posture move um, in conjunction with where the baby is looking. So the other arm would come out and the, and the opposite arm would flex behind their neck. Again, in that like fencing posture. Um, okay, so self-regulation. Self he I'm trying to figure out how to explain this in the easiest way. So Gazelle would say that there's an innate like timetable within babies that's so strong that they can actually regulate their own development. And that when they're allowed to determine their own schedule, they eventually work out a schedule of their own. And so he would say, don't force the baby to adhere to a schedule that you prefer, but rather let the baby determine their own nursing and sleeping schedules. And eventually they will require fewer feedings, they'll stay awake longer, um, and they'll follow this pattern. However, um, he believed that self-regulation also ensured the baby didn't learn too much too fast. He was a very firm believer in babies knowing or having an innate ability to develop at the rate that they need to. So he would point out that when it seems like babies are resisting learning something new, it's because they may not be ready yet, and the integrity of their development has to be maintained. So they will, they will learn it when they're ready, and they'll be more open to it when they're ready. And he didn't discuss individuality very much, um, not specifically, but he did maintain that sequ the sequential aspect of development was the same for all kids, but there was a difference in the rate. And he said again that that would vary according to temperament and personality. And he even gave, in your book it discusses how he talked about um, three children, he gave an example Child A, Child B, and Child C. These were hypothetical children to develop, I mean, I'm sorry, to illustrate individuality. So he said, for example, Child A might grow slowly and is generally cautious and slow. Um, child is able to wait, is even-tempered, and is wise about life's problems. 
Child B might grow fast, uh, reacts more quickly, is happy, bright, and clever, and shows brilliance. And then child C would grow not, not fast or slow, but more in between. Um, it may have some bursts where they are slow and cautious and other patterns where they react quickly. And that each child develops in the way that fits their temperament and their personality in a way that's necessary. And that trying to change that or force that would be problematic for the child. So you can probably guess where his philosophy of child rearing is heading. Um, he believed that you have to follow the child's cues and that they guide us and help us know when the timing's right. And the example he gave, gave was of demand feeding. So following a schedule, like letting the infant indicate when he is hungry and then feeding the baby until he's satisfied, but never like waking up the baby because it's time to eat um, and not to change the baby at certain times of the day, but to wait until the baby's cries indicate that he is ready to be changed. So by doing so, you're letting the child develop um, their own internal clock. And he would say, you know, don't focus on what the baby ought to be doing, but follow his cues without pushing and prodding. Uh, let the child develop on their own, and then parents will see that they do develop on their own and they have their own timetable, and they'll learn to trust themselves, and parents will learn to trust them. They will, they will continue to develop. I mean, his whole point was it's not parents that are shaping children and creating their development, that it's an innate ability, and that children have their own timetable. Louise Bates um, Ames was a student and developed some parental advice based upon Gazelle's theory. So number one, give up the notion that how a child turns out is all up to you and there isn't time to waste. Uh, she would say no, just let the child develop at their own rate. Um, they have innate abil abilities, they have sequential patterns they need to follow, and that you need to stop to smell the roses and enjoy the development. That leads us to number two, appreciate the wonder of growth. Instead of focusing on what's coming next, um, stop and realize, you know, there will only be this moment one time and appreciate what's happening in the baby's life now. Respect and maturity, instead of trying to make children into little adults, um, appreciate the fact that the baby needs to learn to creep before he walks.